Reading from the Bible in a year, February 3rd, Genesis chapters 35 and 36, Mark chapter 6, Job 2, and Romans chapter 6. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household servants and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. God will never find it there. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them, so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is, Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, or El Bethel, meaning God of Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So he called its name Alon Bakuth, meaning Oak of Weeping. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram, and he blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel, or Israel, depending on how you pronounce it, shall be your name. So he called him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. And he poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. Then they journeyed from Bethel. When they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel went into labor. and She had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Ben-Oni, meaning son of my sorrow or son of my strength. But his father called him Benjamin, meaning son of the right hand. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. It is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now, the sons of Jacob were twelve. The son of Leah, or sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Paddan Aram. And Jacob came to his father's, uh, rather to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. And Isaac breathed his last, and he died, and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. These are the generations of Esau, that is, Edom. Later, when we hear about the Edomites and how they treat the Israelites, this is why it's such a big deal. Because the Edomites are literally family to the people of Israel. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites, uh, Adah, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, Aholabama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, 
the sister of Nebaioth. And Adah bore to Esau, Eliphaz, Basimath bore Reu, and Olabama uh, bore Jeush, Jalem, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, and all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went into a land away from his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together, and the land of their sojournings could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Adah, the wife of Esau, Reuel, the son of Basimath, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Taman, Omar, Zepho, Gatan, or Gatam, and Kenaz. Timnah was a concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These are the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Reuel, Nahath, Zerah, Shama, and Mizah. These are the sons of Basimoth, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Aholabama, the daughter of Anah, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. She bore to Esau Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the chiefs of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau, the chiefs of Timon, rather the chiefs Timon, Omar, Zepho, Kanaz, Korah, Gatam, and Amalek. These are the chiefs of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Adah. These are the sons of Reel, Esau's son. The chiefs Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These are the chiefs of Reel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Basimath, Esau's wife. I have a feeling I've already read that. Oh, I did. Ha <laughs> ha. When all of these look the same, it's hard to do that. But hey, we went over it twice. Now we know it extra well. Verse 18, these are the sons of Aholabama, Esau's wife. The chiefs, Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the chiefs born of Aholabama, the daughter of Anna, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, that is, Edom. And these are their chiefs. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, the inhabitants of the land. Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishon. These are the chiefs of the Horites, and the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Lotan, rather the sons of Lotan were Hori and Hemam, and Lotan's sister was Timnah. These are the sons of Shobal, Alvan, Man, excuse me, Manahath, Abal, Shepho, and Onam. These are the sons of Zibion, Aya, and Anna. He is the Anna who found the hot springs in the wilderness, as he pastured donkeys of Zibion, or the donkeys of Zibion, his father. These are the children of Anna, Dishon and Aholabama, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Dishon, Hemden, Eshban, Ithran, and Karen. These are the sons of Ezer, Bilhan, Zaavan, and Akan. These are the sons of Dishon, Uz, and Aaron. These are the son, rather, these are the chiefs of the Horites, the chiefs of Lotan, rather, the chiefs Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, and Dishon. These are the chiefs of the Horites, chiefs by chief in the land of Seir. These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, the name of his city being Dinhabah. This is important. He comes up later. Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah, son of Zerah of Basra, reigned in his place. Jobab died, and Husham, the son, rather Hushan of the land of the Temanites, reigned in his place. Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Badad, who defeated Midian in the country of Moab, reigned in his place. The name of his city being Avith. Hadad died, and Samla of Masrakah reigned in his place. Samla died, and Shaul of Rehoboth on the, on the Euphrates reigned in his place. Shaul died, and Baal Hanan, a son of Akbor, reigned in his place. Baal Hanan, son of Akbor, died, and Hadar reigned in his place. The name of his city being Pau, his wife's name was Mehetabel, the daughter of Matred, 
daughter of, of Mezahab. That's another important name. It'll come up later. These are the names of the chiefs of Esau, according to their clans and their dwelling places, by the names of their, rather by their names, the chiefs Timna, Alva, Jeheth, Oholabama, Ela, Pinon, Kenaz, uh, Taman, Mibzar, Magdiel, and Iram. These are the chiefs of Edom, that is Esau, the father of Edom according to their dwelling places in the land of their possession. Let's move on now to Mark chapter 6. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is the wisdom given to him? How were such mighty works done by his hands? Now, this is a normal question to ask, but they know him. So, their question isn't from awe or wonder. They're more, the, the, the reason why they're asking is because they find it impossible that these things could be true. Continuing in verse 3, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went out, but rather, he went about among the villages teaching. And he had uh, called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear uh, sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. If any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. Then the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? She said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was exceedingly sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison, and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. 
and they and they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and uh, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages, and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread, and give them something to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, Five and two small fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven, said a blessing, and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And rather, he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men not including women and children. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was out to sea, and he was, on, rather, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night... Between 3 and 6 a.m., he came to them walking on the sea, and he meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. They were utterly astonished. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored it, rather moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the, mar- in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. And that is all the notes to hear. Let's move on to Job chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh. And Satan also came among them to present himself before Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered Yahweh and said, From going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. And Yahweh said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? A blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast to his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered Yahweh and said, Skin for skin. All that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh. He will curse you to your face. Yahweh said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of Yahweh and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Stopping here for a second. I don't know how well accepted this is, but it's my belief that his wife, or Satan, entices his wife, and later on his friends, to attack and accuse him. The reason I say this is because they operate as ministers of Satan to Job. 
What is it that Satan wants to have happen? Satan wants Job to curse God and to attack God and blame God for all of his problems. That's all he wants. He wants him to, to lie and to say that he has done something horrible or evil or what have you, or unjustly accuse God for something that God has done against him, because that also would be a sin. And we'll see these things develop as his friends come and talk to him shortly. We'll kind of break it down as we go through them, but that's the underlying theme of the rest of the book of, well, of the next section here of the book of Job when his friends show up. And it's, it's amazing to me how much the words of Job's friends and even the words of his wife here mirror that of the world. What do we hear in the world? Well, the minute something bad happens to you, well, you must have done something bad to cause it to happen. Is it not possible that we just exist under the curse? And that from a worldly perspective, bad things will continue to happen to us until we die and are with Christ forever? Does it have to be something that we specifically did to cause bad things to happen to us? These are the questions people need to ask. Well, people tend to ask. Um, and this is what is typically presented. In fact, I've seen this presented in a lot of different churches. But what we see from, from the, the book of Job and what we see from um, the way this is laid out for us is exactly the opposite. Sometimes bad things just happen. But it's wrong for us to curse God. It's wrong for us to lie and then to, you know, assume that we have done something to cause it. Why not just worship God in both the hard and the good? Thanking him for all of the opportunities he's given us. Continuing on. So his wife says to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the, Naam the Naamathite. And they made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. No one spoke a word to him. But they saw that his suffering was very great. And oh, if they had only kept that and didn't say another word. We'll get to more of that tomorrow. Let's go and conclude today in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Paul continues. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Read the notes. They're amazing in this section. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him um, by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. 
death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let sin, uh, rather, let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Well, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Again, read the notes on this section. Fantastic. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves... You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are, you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That is all the reading and notes for today. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.